All right, welcome back to another episode of the Casey Campbell podcast. Casey Campbell with you, of course. Pleased to be joined by Max Chilton, the driver of the number 59 Gallagher Chevrolet for Carlin Racing. Max, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, I'm, I'm new to podcasts. I've really got into them recently, but really can see the benefit, really enjoy them. I'm not a book reader, um, but I, it's, I like filling the time listening to new podcasts. Um, and uh, it's amazing how many different variations of different podcasts you can listen to just on one category alone. So, yeah, pleasure coming on and hopefully uh, hopefully can answer some questions that you've got for me. OK, so um, start of the season. How do you think it went for you at Barber? So Barber was a struggle. Um, annoyingly, we the reason why it was a struggle is we were the only team that didn't test there. We had had a very good winter build up, though. We've worked harder than we've ever worked before. Uh, we've done a lot more um, uh, development on the car. I've also been working on myself because there's just as much time in myself as in the team. Um, but yeah, it's just frustrating. Barber had to be the first round, especially with this new schedule where practice and qualifying is all in the same day. We're a single car entry with no data to overlay. So it's all a bit um, of a rush to try and work out the best setup. But I think even though we were the only team that didn't test there, we did an okay job. We qualified near the back, yes, but we were within nine tenths in qualifying of a place we didn't test at. So I'm confident we would have got within four or five tenths, which is a good step forward from where we were last year. So um, that was what it was. We had a really good race start for the first two corners and then it went dramatically wrong on the approach to turn three um, due to a pile up. But amazingly, we only had a bit of bodywork damage. Um, all the four wheels were still pointing the right direction. So we finished all 90 laps. Um, we just went two laps down um, due to the accident. So then it was a, a long 90 lap race trying to just, you know, avoid avoid other cars and blue flags and stuff. But I'm more confident going into Sapit. No one's tested there since we raced. Obviously, it's a street circuit. So it's a bit more of a level playing field. And hopefully we can show the gains that we've made over the winter. Yeah. Talk about going to your first street course. I know you've been to St. Pete many times throughout the year, throughout the years you've been in IndyCar. What's it like driving at St. Pete? Um, St. Pete's a, a great one. It's usually obviously the season opener. So it's, um, it's exciting seeing new teams, new drivers, new liveries, new personnel, um, and also seeing the fans after uh, the long six months break that we get from the last race of the season to the first. So it's always great. Um, obviously this year it's the second race uh, of the calendar. It's been delayed um, due to the, the, the world situation, um, but it's good to be back here. It's going to be hot. It's also a very physical race because it's um, even if it runs green, it's nearly a two hour race. So with the yellows, it's it's over a two hour race. Um, so, yeah, you get through your drinks bottle pretty quickly, but it's a fun track. It's a great city. I'm a big fan of St. Pete um, and uh, it's good to be back. So I, I know there's been, you know, I, I know you're from the UK, of course. Um, there's been a lot of things that are have been happening there. Of course, um, two major things I want to point on. For those who don't understand, like, you know, the impact of, you know, what Prince Philip has been to and the royal family in general, what what's it like, you know, grow, what was it like growing up there, knowing and seeing him and all that? What, what were your finest memories of him? Um, you make it sound like I know him personally and I have fond memories. He, I don't know. I never met him personally. See, uh, well, when you when you saw him and talked with him, it feels like he kind of did know him because of the person that he was a little bit. Yeah, no, he, you know, he, he took our nation um, uh, in, in his heart. Uh, he's obviously, his wife has been a fantastic queen and still will be for hopefully many years to come. I, I'm a big uh, fan of the royal family. I think they do a lot for our country. I think they do a lot for other countries around the world. Um, and he was a huge supporting act to the queen for 73 years. So um, the thing I liked about him is he, he absolutely said what he thought. There was no... Uh, no hiding what he thought and he would say it exactly how it is which I think is you know a breath of fresh air in this day and age also with his age you can get away with saying things which people our age probably can't so it was uh he was a great a great person um witty and yeah very sad to see his passing um but I haven't been back to the UK since of his passing so uh, I haven't been able to to go to Windsor Castle or, or leave any flowers or anything like that. Okay so another thing I know the biggest thing and the biggest topic of conversation um, in the last few days um, has been the so-called European Super League. Of course, I'm talking about the Premier League and all that. You know, a lot of fan, a lot of people maybe here in America don't know how big of an impact of that European football has on the world. 
Um, I do because I've, I've been a fan for it for um, at least a few years since some friends got me into it. But how big is big is European football in the Premier League in your, in in the UK? I think football in general around the world, it's the biggest sport in the world. It's it's played in pretty much every country in the world. Um, America is one of the few where obviously it is played, but NFL massively overdoes soccer over here. Um, but football in general for me is the biggest sport in the world. And, and it really lies in the Premier League in the UK and also, um, you know, the Champions League with teams like Barcelona, Real Madrid, all the major countries in Europe. So it's a, it's a huge sport. I'm more of a rugby fan, um, which is sort of where NFL came from. It's that more that kind of rule base. But I do I do love watching football as well. I'm a Spurs fan, um, but it is huge. And the news with this new um, Super League, I didn't fully understand it until I watched James Corden's six minute rant last night on the Late Late Show. And I think what he did is he summed it up absolutely perfectly. And it's it's the people's games. These clubs are a hundred years plus old, and they were started from the local workers and built up to what they are. And now they've been taken over by these billionaires who've tried to make their own series where they can't be relegated and they take all the prize money. It is sacrilege. So I think the outburst from all the fans all over the world, um, I think it'll be interesting the next week of development to see whether it lasts or not, because um, the outcry from football supporters has been hugely negative so far. Yeah, it's looking like it's uh, looking like it's not going to last that long from some of the reports that I saw um, yep. with Chelsea and Man City leaving and all that fun stuff. But of course, um, if you want to see all the impact, go back a few episodes in my podcast. We had Jack Edwards on from one of the social media channels, and you can kind of get into all that. But anyway, back to uh, you know IndyCar and racing and stuff. This is a big this is a big year for you. I know you were you've been with Carlin, you know, forever um, for well as long as I can remember. Um, but you know, going into this IndyCar season. What's it going to be like on the, you know, the road and street courses that you normally ran on? Of course, you'll run the Indy 500 as well. What's, what is it going to be like running a lot of those courses and what courses are you looking forward to? Um, obviously, I came from European Formula One kind of style racing. So I prefer the, the you call them road courses over here. Uh, we just call them racetracks. Um, but the, the road and street races of where I've come from. Um, and so I, they're my favorite. The Indy 500 is one I continue to do, which is the only oval that I do do, just because it's such a special event. It's one of the biggest races in the world. Um, I came so close to winning it in 2017. I felt like I got the milk but didn't get to taste it. So I want to try and make sure that I get it one year. Um, and it's also a fantastic city with great su support from all over the country. People fly in for it. It's the biggest single day sporting event in the world, I still believe. Um, but yeah, the road and street courses, America's still got some fantastic, um, you know, really pure racetracks, places like mid Ohio, which are fast, undulating, blind corners, great places for spectators to see four or five corners in one, one place. Um, and also very little runoff, just a grass, you know, a grass edge and that's it. So people, places like Watkins Glen, which I, I will really miss off of the schedule, uh, road America, um, there, there's some really, really good tracks here. So I'm enjoying racing out here. Yeah. Um, best part about, you know, racing an IndyCar, what's your favorite track that you, that you've particularly done well on over the years? Um, you know, I, I, I love Watkins Glen. We don't race anymore. So I've got to move on with it. I think Road America's the, the, the once you've driven a perfect lap there or is near to your best qualifying lap it's quite hard to beat because it's such a long lap. So you're for nearly two minutes trying to perfect a lap. It's undulating, it's long, it's fast. It offers everything. And it's also a beautiful place. I think Barber's great. It's a lot shorter and a lot more um, uh, fast paced is and you know, you're constantly turning. There's very little rest. The, the good thing with uh, Road America is there's long straights to sort of take everything in, rest, prepare for the next sector. So um it's great, and I, I love the the, the pure, purest of uh, racetracks that you get out here. And then, of course, um, after after St. Pete, well, of course, they're going to Texas. You won't be competing in that, but um, in you'll be on the Indy Road Course, and then Indy Five Hundred. It looks like from a lot of the races, this how the schedule set up. It's really, you know, some the beginning part of the schedule. What it used to be, it was all really spread out. Now it's more condensed with the, you know, the schedule really get there. It's what's a, I mean, racers want to race. They don't want to wait around to do anything. Uh, you know, yeah. you guys with testing and all that, but what's it, 
how different has the schedule been for you this year adjusting to years previously? Um, the schedule this year is very similar to last year. I think last year was the one which massively condensed it. We had a lot of back-to-back -back races, which we've never done before, or double headers, um, apart from Detroit. But we've now got double headers. And I think it's, it's good for the fans. They can come for a one race weekend and at certain tracks get to watch two races. I think that's likely to probably happen. I can't see Toronto personally going ahead. So we'll probably end up having a double header at Mid Ohio or another double header at, road, at the road course at Indy. So it's, it's good for that. Um, part of being a racing driver is you've got to be adaptive. Last year, we all had to be adaptive. Everyone in the world had to be adaptive last year because everything was changing around us. Um, but no, it's great. And I think uh, we've got a great schedule. Um, obviously, we have to try and fit in around the NFL schedule because they, uh, they sort of override us. So we have quite an intense series anyway from middle of March to September. And then there's this huge, nearly six months off to the first race in mid-March. Um, but it's good. We work very hard for six months, plus the testing either side. But then we get a nice uh, a downtime. Formula One lack that downtime anymore. They finish early December and before you know it, they're testing end of January. So there's very little sort of rest period. But um, I think I think uh, definitely the teams, the mechanic side of things, would definitely rather be doing a mechanic in, uh, in, in IndyCar than Formula One where you get no, no, off, no off time. All right. Max Shilton, thank you so much for coming on and spending a few minutes. Uh, um, uh, we'll have you, let's have you on again sometime later on in the year. Brilliant. Thank you.